The human body produces waste in many forms. While there are different organs that eliminate different types of waste, the urinary system, and specifically the kidneys, plays an unparalleled role in the elimination of specific types of waste, like urea, which is produced from the breakdown of amino acids. While excretion of waste is the main role of the kidneys, they also help the body do other things like regulate blood volume, pressure, solute concentrations, and extracellular fluid pH. To comprehend how the physiology of the kidneys work, we first need to understand the anatomical structures that make up these organs. The kidneys are located on either side of the vertebral column, starting around the 12th thoracic vertebrae, and are posterior to the other well-known abdominal organs. Interestingly, the right kidney sits a bit lower than the left because it is inferior to the liver. Each kidney is shaped like a bean and has three main connecting tubes for materials to pass through, which include the renal artery, renal vein, and ureter. The renal artery moves unfiltered, deoxygenated blood to the kidneys to be filtered and to supply the kidney tissue with oxygen, while the renal vein moves the deoxygenated blood from the kidney back to the inferior vena cava. The ureter then moves any waste products accumulated in the kidney, like urine, away from the organ to be excreted. Other important structures to note at the organ level are the outer cortex and the inner medulla, which houses structures called renal pyramids. Taking a closer look at the anatomy within the cortex and medulla, you can see that things get a bit more complex. At the microscopic scale, we can begin to see the functional structures that exist within the kidney. These structures are called nephrons and can be broken down into smaller parts that have specific functions. For now, let's just focus on the anatomy. In order of functionality, we have the renal corpuscle, which is made up of the glomerulus and Bowman capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, collecting ducts, and the papillary duct. All of these structures together constitute one functional nephron. Other important additional structures include the afferent arterial, efferent arterial, peritubular capillaries, and the interlobular vein. How do all of these pieces function together to make the system work? I'm so glad you asked. The kidneys, and these functional subunits called nephrons, filter, reabsorb, and secrete substances at different times to both create and eliminate urine from the body. If we are to look at a nephron, the way at which material is filtered and moved through it, we should start with the renal corpuscle. Blood from the afferent arterial, which is branched from the renal artery, is filtered through a specialized capillary that exists within the renal corpuscle, and the created liquid, called filtrate, continues to move down the proximal convoluted tube. This tube extends down from the cortex into the renal medulla within the loop of Henle. This loop has two parts, labeled as the descending limb and ascending limb. As you can guess, the descending limb of the loop of Henle is where filtrate moves away from the proximal convoluted tubule deeper into the medulla, and the ascending limb moves the contents back towards the cortex to the next structure called the distal convoluted tubule. This tube then connects to the final piece of the nephron, called the collecting duct. The collecting duct connects and leads the waste, which is now urine, out to the ureter. While the filtrate is moving through the convoluted tubules and loop of Henle, the blood that was filtered in the renal corpuscle gets pushed out the efferent arterial. It then travels through the peritubular capillary network wrapped around the tubules and loop of Henle, dropping off oxygen, exchanging, and reabsorbing solutes and water from the filtrate which supports the process of creating the urine that is excreted. Here are some specifics about the absorption and movement of different molecules within this system. A large amount of water and solute from the filtrate is reabsorbed back into the blood from the proximal convoluted tubule. More water is reabsorbed from the filtrate into the blood via the thin segment of the descending limb. Additional solutes are reabsorbed from the ascending limb as these cells are not permeable to water. The distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts continue to reabsorb water and solutes, leaving a small amount of urine left in the filtrate. While this reabsorption process is taking place, harmful substances are also being secreted from the blood into the proximal and distal convoluted tubules, contributing to the creation of urine. Examples include uric acid, bile pigments, ammonia, drugs, and other chemical toxins. 
The deoxygenated, cleaner blood in the paratubular capillary leaves via the interlobular vein which connects back to the renal vein. While it is helpful to understand how urine is made in a general sense, let's also consider that the volume and concentration of urine can differ greatly and is dependent upon different hormonal mechanisms that control both factors. To keep things simple, let's just focus on one important mechanism that can help us understand this connection between urine volume and concentration, called the antidiuretic hormone mechanism, noted as ADH. Specialized neurons in the hypothalamus produce ADH and store it in the pituitary gland. When solute changes occur in the blood and interstitial fluid, it triggers the release of, or inhibits the release of, ADH. When osmolality increases, meaning there are more solutes in your fluids, ADH is released into the bloodstream. This ADH protein travels through the paratubular network and binds to an ADH receptor in the collection duct. A protein mechanism then gets activated that ultimately binds aquaporin protein channels to the membranes on the cells that make up the collection duct, allowing them to be more permeable to water. This will force water to move out of the collection duct and into the interstitial fluid and paratubular capillaries, leaving the urine with a higher concentration of solutes to excrete. On the flip side, if osmolality is decreased in the body, then ADH is not produced, meaning that the protein mechanisms do not function and water stays in the urine, making it less concentrated and more dilute. When the urine is completely filtered based on the physiology of the body, it is moved down a tube called the ureter which brings it to the final destination of the urinary bladder. The volume of the bladder increases and stretches as urine enters from the ureters, which works because some of the surrounding tissue is made up of transitional epithelium. These cells, when pressure is applied to them, shift in such a way that allows the tissue to stretch and retain a high pressure within the bladder. When ready to be expelled from the body, the urine gets pushed down the urethra which leads to the end of the penis for males and the end of the urethral orifice for females, which is superior to the vaginal opening. Problems with kidneys can be revealed through urinary tests that detect certain chemicals found within urine. These tests, which can be completed with urine test strips, can identify levels of protein and glucose in the urine as well as indicate the pH. This can be extremely helpful as high levels of glucose and proteins in the urine can be an indicator for diabetes and other signs of kidney damage. If someone is experiencing kidney failure, their two options for treatment are renal dialysis or a kidney transplant. Within the process of renal dialysis, also called hemodialysis, blood is moved from an artery into a dialysis machine that filters blood like an artificial kidney using semi-permeable membranes to catch large proteins and blood cells. The filtered, purified blood then is sent back to the body via a vein. This four-hour treatment needs to be done around three times per week to take over the complete function of failing kidneys. Aging plays a role with urinary system function. In a nutshell, as you age, kidney tissue begins to decrease in size, starting from about age 20, which decreases the amount of blood that is filtered at any given moment. While this might seem pretty scary, it is important to note that homeostasis can be achieved for the entire human adult body if just one-third of one kidney is functioning properly. So, aging generally reduces the reserved capacity of your kidneys to filter blood and create urine. When you reach age 70, 80, and beyond is when the kidney tissue really begins to show signs of degradation and loss of function as many of the main components of the nephrons become degraded in a large portion of the tissue. This increases the damage caused by other diseases such as diabetes, atherosclerosis, and high blood pressure, all of which must be watched carefully in older patients.